Welcome to the Cape Cod Maritime Museum's Fall 2022 Winter 2023 Lecture Series. Um, it's been a while since we were all together this way, so um, it's lovely to be able to join together. I am Mary Everett Patrickwin, the museum's Public Programs Coordinator, and behind the scenes making all the technical wizardry happen is our Executive Director, Elizabeth York. Uh, before I forget, uh, I do want to acknowledge that our lecture series this year is sponsored in part by a Bridge Street grant that's an initiative of the Mass Humanities Foundation. They do wonderful work to support uh, the humanities all across the state, so a big thank you to them. Um, if this is your first time joining us, um, welcome. We're always happy to have uh, new folks jump in. And we hope that you'll come and visit us uh, at the museum proper. So we are open uh, right now Wednesdays through Saturdays from 10 to 4. And um, please, yeah, come on down. It's especially while the weather is still uh, good and we get those lovely uh, sunny fall days. So um, if you enjoy this kind of programming, we hope that you will consider becoming a member of the museum. Memberships start at $45. They help to support not only our lecture series, but our Young Mariners program, uh, and a whole host of other things that we have going on at the museum. Um, all righty. And oh my gosh, do we have a lot going on at the museum in the month of October? All kinds of things. So uh, not only today's lecture, but we have another one on October 16th. That is uh, Native American perspectives on the uh, on reclaiming the Charles River watershed, um, an area that's so uh, close to Cape Cod Bay. Uh, that is by Hartman Dietz, who is Mashpee Wampanoag. And then on October 30th, we have Sandy McFarlane, who's back to talk about uh, 50 years in the development of the shellfishing industry uh, in New England. Lots of interesting um, stuff there to dig into. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't, <laughs> pun not intended, shellfishing, digging, whatever. Okay, um, we also have um, our first boat building um, workshop. This year is gonna take us uh, through a and kind of an entire boat building process. So the fall class is going to be on lofting and that starts October 25th with our own boat right, Bruce Colvin. Um, we have a couple of wonderful craft workshops. On October 11th, we're going to have um, a shell and resin art workshop. Um, you can make a, a lovely handcrafted um, decorative item. And uh, also on October 25th, we have Geotaku and Saki Night. Um, for those of you who uh, weren't there for our Geotaku workshop back in August, Geotaku is the Japanese art of making prints from fish. Um, and so we had a wonderful time. I, I think we had more adults than, than kids. Um, so it was just a fun time to get together, just to play with some art materials, have some fun, and of course, sake. So um, that's a few of the things we have going on uh, during the month. If you'd like more information on any of those things, you can visit our website which is capecodmaritimemuseum.org. And uh, again, we hope, uh, hope you'll join us. So um, today, um, I'm very pleased to, pronounce, uh, to introduce one of our own. Uh, that is Emily Sullivan, our curator. Uh, Emily joined the museum in February of this year. Uh, she has a, B a BA from Boston University in history and an MA from American University in Public History. And she's going to be giving us a talk today about um, the Lighthouse Establishment. And this is just a taster uh, for our Lighthouse exhibit, which is going to be opening on October 20th. So greetings, Emily. Hello, everybody. Thank you, Mary, for that, for that introduction. Um, so as Mary said, um, I just started here in February. So um, it's been, you know, I guess about six months at this point, which is very exciting. Um, and uh, this lecture really sort of came out of while we were developing stuff for our Lighthouse exhibit, which as she said is opening on October 20th. Um, we started uh, doing some digging into, you know, how do we want to tell the story and what sort of stuff do we want to really make sure that it's got strong connections to Cape Cod, et cetera, et cetera. And, um, 
while I, uh, one of the sort of things about being a public historian versus, and with a lot of my sort of background is um, you tend not to be 100% a specialist in one particular very specific topic. You um, need to sort of be, you know, willing and able to jump into basically anything. So I didn't know all that much about lighthouses um, before jumping into this. And uh was, you know, very excited to discover that um, in the early days of um, the U.S. government managing our lighthouses, um, a resident of Wellfleet, so one of our own from the Cape, um, was incredibly instrumental in uh, pretty much everything there was to do about lighthouses um, from a period of about 1810 to um, the 1850s. So uh, that's what we're going to be doing today. I uh, was something I thought would be a great fit for this lecture series is as we were sort of workshopping the lighthouse exhibit, um, it's a really great story, but it just sort of didn't, it wasn't really fitting with the general flow of what we were going for for the exhibit. Unfortunately, we have a limited amount of space and, you know, we could make the whole museum about lighthouses on Cape Cod if we wanted to. So um, I very sadly had to cut this from the final version. And then when Mary um, approached me saying, hey, would you like to do a talk about lighthouses for our fall um, programming session? I was like, oh, absolutely. I know the I know the story that would just be, you know, really, really interesting to get into. And it's a, you know, it's a fun compliment to the exhibit um, instead of just kind of rehashing something that like you guys could come down in two weeks and see up on the wall. Um, all right. So let's see if this is going to, there we go. <laughs> so, okay. Uh, after the American Revolution, um, the U.S. is finally able to really start kickstarting its maritime trade and industry. During the war, it was pretty dangerous for folks to just be, you know, out on the water um, trying to do international trade or even local trade sometimes when you had, you know, hostile British ships roaming about trying to, uh, kind of choke the Americans out. Um, so, sorry, I'm now getting notifications from our antivirus. Okay, sorry. <laughs> so um, when you have more industry on the water, that means you're gonna have more ships um, coming in and out of your harbors and just sort of in the general area. And more ships means that you need to have more lighthouses to both signal to people, hey, this is, you know, Boston or Charleston or any other harbor come here or, this is a really dangerous pile of rocks, stay away. Um, the US did have lighthouses before this period, um, even if we weren't necessarily you know, as big of a maritime power as we would grow to be. The first lighthouse in the US was um, Boston Light, which was first lit in September of, 16, of 1716. Um, and on August 7th, 1789, the first Congress passed an act for the establishment and support of lighthouses, beacons, buoys, and public piers. At that time, there were only 12 lighthouses in the U.S., but by 1842, there were 250. So as you can see, it's been a really exponential growth in this period of lighthouses in the U.S. And for better or worse, the person most responsible for those lighthouses existing in the first place and uh, physical construction and such was Winslow Lewis. Um, born Win Nathaniel Winslow Lewis in Wellfleet, Massachusetts on May 11th, 1770. He was a ship captain by trade. Um, he largely traveled the packet trade between Boston and Liverpool. Um, the packet trade is basically if you're someone who needs to get to Liverpool to, you know, conduct business, whether just yourself or some goods, but you don't have a ship yourself and you don't want to hire out like a whole ship necessarily, you could hire someone like Winslow Lewis who would take you and other people like that to Liverpool. The ships would advertise that they're departing on a particular date at a particular time from a particular port. And then once you got to your destination, you could hire another packet ship and take your way back home or to wherever else you needed to go. Unfortunately for Lewis and his uh, competitors, um, he was forced to look for other business opportunities during, thanks to the embargoes against American merchants during the Napoleonic Wars. This whole period is really a challenging time to work on the sea. Um, you have the American Revolution, Napoleonic Wars, the War of 1812, just lots and lots of activity that, um, you know, can present a lot of challenges of, you know, hey, I want to continue to sell my goods or go fishing, but, um, you know, there's some small chance that my ship could be basically seized by an enemy government and, you know, just sometimes you're like, maybe that's not worth the risk, time to start looking into other options, which is what Winslow Lewis did. Um, at this time in the U.S., Lighthouses are lit by these devices called spider lamps. Um, they're these 
structures that have a very large oil reservoir and a greater number of wicks than an individual candle or lamp, which helps throw off more light. Um, you would often have multiple spider lamp rigs like this hung up in a lighthouse, each one having multiple wicks, and they were fueled by whale oil. Um, while they were better than just, you know, lighting a bonfire at the top of your lighthouse, they were quite inefficient. They used a lot of oil to operate and they cast a lot of smoke, which obscured the light and dirtied the lighthouse lens, which further obscured the light and made the, uh, you know, the keeper have to keep continually wiping it clean. So, you know, a little frustrating if, if you're the keeper. Um, the lights themselves also weren't particularly strong because there was nothing in them that really focused the light in any particular fashion. It's just candles, but more than one, essentially. Meanwhile, um, in Europe, they had adopted the Argon lamp, uh, which had been invented by um, some guys from Geneva. They were designed to help focus beams of light to make them stronger and more visible to ships at sea. The flame has a glass chimney over it, which um, helps both focus its burn and also protects it from wind, rain, etc. Um, and it's paired with a parabolic reflector, which helps make the light hundreds of times more intense. The light bounces off the reflector and is concentrated into a beam that shines in the direction the, the reflector is facing. Um, so Winslow Lewis comes along and in 1810 submits a patent for a Lewis light seen in this illustration here. As you can see, it is very similar to a Argon light. It has a glass cylinder around the light with a reflector behind it, um, focusing the light through a lens. It's unclear if Lewis genuinely developed the light or this idea by himself or not. Um, it is theoretically possible that he, while, you know, trying to find something else to uh, get cash flowing when he had to step aside from the packet trade, that he did, you know, fiddle around with lights and decide, hey, this is, you know, something that's still maritime adjacent, but here we can, here we go. But the similarities are so similar and uh, Lewis did not have a background in science or optics in any way. So it's a little, it's a little suspect. But at the time, it was a lot easier to get a patent than it is today because the patent office was very small, understaffed, which I'm sure is probably still a problem today. And it really relied on the applicant saying to the clerk, to the best of my knowledge, this is something that I have invented and nobody else has created something similar. The clerk would then compare it to patents that were already on file with the US office, but there wasn't an international archive that they had ready access to. And there was no easy way for them to communicate with other countries and say, hey, do you have something like this in your patent office? So for better or worse, the US government in 1812 purchases the patent rights to his invention to improve lighthouse lights. These lights were an improvement over the spider lamps. Um, they would often be used um, in a big rig like this, so it's not just one lens and one light. Um, however, there were a few key problems. Um, Lewis's lamps used spherical reflectors, not parabolic. This meant that the beams of light were not focused straight ahead, but instead bounce around and reflect back on the light source, which makes it only slightly brighter than the source itself, compared to the argon lamp, which creates a much stronger forward facing beam, essentially. Um, the reflectors he used also weren't very reflective. He used poor materials and the lenses were made of poor quality green glass. These were much more cheaply made than similar lights that were in European lighthouses at the time. But the biggest selling point for the US government was really twofold. It was slightly better than the spider lamps, which is, you know, an improvement is better than nothing. And they used significantly less whale oil than the spider lamps did, up to 50% in some cases, 50% less. Um, oil was the most expensive part of running a lighthouse, and that's pretty much historically true for the entire time the US government is using both animal fat and um, kerosene. And, you know, technically even now, like, you know, electricity would be, uh, you know, one of the more expensive parts of running a, a lighthouse. So this was seen as a huge improvement for the US government and represented just enormous savings. So, in 1812, Lewis signs a contract with Treasury Secretary Albert Gallatin to sell his patent to the U.S. and install his lamps in all lighthouses in the U.S. within two years for a sum of $24,000, which is approximately $530,000 in today's money. Additionally, he was to be paid $500 per year, which is about $11,000 in today's money, 
for the next seven years to keep the lamps in good repair. The terms of the contract said that Lewis's lamps must burn oil at half the rate of the older lamps and must provide a, quote, more brilliant light than appears from the present mode of lighting. So essentially, as long as he hit that target, he was going to have a pretty you know, consistent flow of money coming in. This project was unfortunately delayed by the War of 1812 and included um, a pretty, a pretty uh, crazy side story, which unfortunately I didn't find too, too much information with uh, uh, of the details, I guess. Um, but uh, in 1813, Lewis, his ship and equipment were all captured by the British um, and his equipment and ship were burned. So as you can imagine, that sort of delayed making it around to all the towers and getting the new lamps installed. But by 1816, he had installed his lamps across the whole U.S. lighthouse system. The following year, he was awarded a contract from the government to supply oil to all lighthouses. This is a really significant moment in his career because he didn't have to bid on the contract at all. The U.S. government just gave it to him because they trusted him as, hey, this guy knows lighthouses. He can get stuff done. He saves us a lot of money. Let's just go with him to be our supplier. And it had a very kind of cushy side effect. Anything that wasn't used by the lighthouses, he could take and resell or use for his own businesses. So this was a pretty, it continues to be a very sweet gig for him. Um, things would continue to work in Lewis's favor after the appointment of Stephen Pleasanton as fifth auditor of the treasury, which happened in, uh, he gets basically put in charge of um, lighthouse matters and the lighthouse establishment in uh, in addition to all the other things this role would have to do in 1820. Um, history buffs may know Stephen Pleasanton as the fellow who, when the British came to burn the White House during uh, the War of 1812, he organized um, the rescue of really important historical documents like the Declaration of Independence and the U.S. Constitution. So if you've ever been down to the National Archives in D.C. and you've seen those documents, this dour fellow is the reason you get to see the real ones and not just copies. Um, as a thank you, he kept getting promoted into cushier and cushier government positions until he finally ended up as fifth auditor. As fifth auditor, he was responsible for all domestic accounts pertaining to the Department of State and the Patent Office, all bankers, consular and diplomatic accounts in foreign countries, as well as census accounts, claims adjustments for foreign governments, and boundary commissioner accounts. So lots of bureaucratic, money-related things. Not a lot of specifically maritime, scientific optical, anything that really goes into running a lighthouse. And he personally had no background in those things. Um, so he came into this and saw the government was working with this fellow, Winslow Lewis, to, you know, make these improvements to the lighthouses. Lewis was a mariner. So he really said, OK, this is the guy that I want to work with to continue to push this stuff forward. I trust him to know what is best. The other thing that he really liked about Lewis was um, Stephen Pleasanton was incredibly budget conscious. This is like the defining character trait of him as a person and a government employee. He would always prefer to get things done cheaply and efficiently. And Lewis clearly recognized this in him and they formed this very tight partnership of we wanna to continue to work on these things but do it in a budget friendly way no matter what. So at this point, Lewis also starts to uh, transition into becoming an actual lighthouse engineer and um, builder. Lewis's lighthouses worked from a standard model. This sketch you see here is just an absolutely like perfect example of almost every single one of his lighthouses looks identically <laughs> identical to this. He worked uh, with five different sizes of lighthouses, 25, 30, 40, 50, and 65 feet high. Virtually all of them were constructed of brick, although some were made of stone. He was responsible for building about 80 of these, but very few of them survive today. Even when brand new, many of his lights were criticized for being too short, poorly made, or desperately in need of immediate repairs. Part of this is that because he was so focused on making sure that they were, you know, not spending a lot of money into this, he wasn't necessarily investing in the best materials and tended to cut corners on certain things that as like a modern person would probably find fairly surprising when coming to a, a government contract for something as vital as a lighthouse. Um, he wouldn't do things like 
let's survey the land and see what sort of tweaks would need to be changed to our like cookie cutter lighthouse to make sure that this building can withstand the test of time. So a lighthouse that was going to be built on rocky terrain with a really solid you know, base under it would be built exactly the same way as a lighthouse on Cape Cod on very sandy, unstable ground, which can cause a lot of problems and these sort of you know, get exponentially worse as the building becomes older and is being battered by weather, wind, waves, etc. So, um, interestingly, uh, for folks who, uh, you know, are from the Cape or have visited, hope that's most of you, um, here is a sketch that he uh, submitted for redesigning Chatham Light in the early 1840s. Chatham had two twin wood towers at this point that were desperately in need of repair. So Lewis bid on and got the contract to replace these. And this is his proposal for what the finished product would look like. And as you can see, the tower designs are pretty much exactly the same as the tower on the previous side. They're just missing the sort of brick base. Um, so it was really a one size fits all lighthouse. Meanwhile, over in Europe, um, European lighthouses have started to transition to using the Fresnel lens, just named after its inventor who died tragically young of tuberculosis. Um, it's really a shame for the scientific community because he was quite a brilliant guy and uh, definitely would have been cool to see what else he could have invented had he not um, you know, succumbed to, at the time, one of the worst illnesses in the world. Um, Fresnel lenses are stepped lenses, which reduces the amount of material that's needed to construct the lens, while also increasing the visibility and brightness of the light. These were already starting to be installed in European lighthouse be lighthouses beginning in 1836. So for folks who traveled between the United States and Europe, they were starting to really see, okay, the U.S. lighthouses are a little better than they used to be, but European lights are like way better than the U.S. lights. They are super bright. You can almost always see the light even in bad weather. And the U.S. lights are not really holding a candle to this. So this is sort of the period where things start to slowly turn against Winslow Lewis as the lighthouse expert and his buddy Stephen Pleasanton as the best person to be running the lighthouse establishment. During the 1830s, brothers Edmund and George W. Blunt began advocating for the adoption of Fresnel lenses at American lighthouses. These two guys published um, materials that would be distributed and purchased by folks who were engaging in maritime trade um, to basically give them updates on like, you know, this light has changed in such a, it used to be rotating, but now it's stationary or a new lighthouse is being installed here. Um, here are some hazards that you should be aware of, basically kind of coast watchy stuff. Um, and they were really the first people to start blowing the whistle on, hey, European lights are really, really good and ours are kind of embarrassing in comparison. This is also the first time that they start, someone starts commenting on how Pleasanton's budget conscious ways are allowing people without any engineering or construction backgrounds to get contracts to build lighthouses, which means they're poorly built. Instead of relying on experts or people who are really experienced in their field, he's just going for whoever is giving him the cheapest proposal. And that's really not something you want to hear for something as critically important to navigational safety as a lighthouse. Pleasanton immediately responds back, defending himself, Lewis, and the lighthouses. He insists that European lights are more costly to operate and that American lights were definitely not poorly built. He also was insistent that Fresnel lenses were too expensive and not worth the effort of purchasing and importing because American lights were bright enough. Um, to back up his statements, he brought in the testimony of a bunch of retired sea captains and local mariners to defend the quality of U.S. lights. And this really presents two problems. If you're a retired sea captain, you probably haven't been to Europe recently to be able to confidently compare a modern European light with a Fresnel lens to a, you know, American light. So you probably don't actually have firsthand experience with how much brighter these lights actually are. If you're a local mariner, you're also a lot more familiar with your local hazards and navigational tools and just what's what it's like to live there. If I'm a cod fisherman and I operate off Cape Cod, I probably, you know, know a lot about the difference between Highland, Nauset, and Chatham lights. Um, so I can, even if a light is out of commission or it's changed, I probably know a little bit more about, hmm, this is probably where I am. I can navigate around some stuff. I'm pretty safe. But if you're someone who hasn't been to Cape Cod in a long time, or perhaps never before, um, you're coming from somewhere international, it can be really difficult to tell the difference between different lights and know where to go and how to be safe. Um, 
And also a local mariner, again, doesn't have the experience of comparing a European light to an American light. Lewis also enters the conversation by defending himself with um, mathematical figures, proving that his lights are incredibly strong and definitely not in need of adjustment. But a lot of these figures were scientifically impossible. Um, if Boston light was really th visible from 30 miles away, thanks to the curvature of the earth, a ship would need to be at an elevation of 289 feet to see it. So that's one heck of a wave for your uh, ship to be riding to see the light. Um, as much as they're defending themselves, Congress starts thinking, all right, we should probably like start looking into this a little bit. So they launch an investigation in 1838 that ends up backing up most of what the blunts have said. Lighthouses are not well made, and they've also realized in some places there are way too many lighthouses, which confuses mariners a lot. Um, if you don't have enough sort of distinctive notes, it all just becomes kind of a big jumbled mess, and people either pull into the wrong port thinking, I must be in you know, Boston, I'm going to pull in here, and you're actually at Nantucket, or, you know, you can wreck your ship on something that you thought was actually a light signaling, you know, it's safe to come here. So that's pretty dangerous and something that needed to be addressed. Um, they also decided, all right, let's start investigating what it would mean to get some Fresnel lenses, and are they actually any good? So they task Matthew Perry, Another name you might remember from other historical adventures, such as um, being the, the fellow to open uh, Japan to the West. Um, this, is this is well before all of that happens. So uh, this is a photo of him as an older guy, um, but this is him as a young man, is uh, tasked with getting two Fresnel lenses from France, but these wouldn't al arrive until 1840. Pleasanton also tries to delay the Fresnel lenses arrival as long as possible, probably due to his own ego, as well as his budget conscious everything. <laughs> so when the Fresnel lenses arrive, a lot of folks are saying, oh wow, these really are significantly better and we like them a lot. But Pleasanton sticks to his guns, as does Lewis, who, while he acknowledges that the Fresnel lenses are very bright, he believed that they were, quote, too complicated and liable to get out of order. He thought they would need constant attendance, which would mean an even greater financial burden on the lighthouse establishment and the government, because if you need a light being watched 24 seven, you need to hire another keeper to keep an eye on it. You can't rely on just one keeper to, uh, to get the job done. So while this is all happening, Winslow Lewis's nephew, Isaiah William Penn Lewis, a civil engineer, um, starts getting lighthouse contracts thanks to his uncle. Um, from the 1830s through the 1840s, he was hired by Pleasanton for several different projects, which gave him an up close and personal look at the process and all the flaws involved in building and repairing lighthouses. Um, he did work on his own lighthouse designs. This sketch here is um, one of his screw pile lighthouses from the Florida Keys, um, which he really wanted to see used on Cape Cod and the islands because they're really great for um, offshore positions. Um, they're basically on long iron spindly legs that help keep them very stable even in rough water. Um, but so while I feel like a lot of what I've kind of been saying is talking about maybe building new lighthouses or repairing existing ones, um, Lewis is really doing both of those things. He's both helping build, like bidding on contracts that are building new lighthouses, but also repairing existing ones. So he gets to see sort of the whole look at how this whole process works and really start to have just get a very sour look <laughs> at everything. Um, because as he's working on some of these um, older lighthouses, it's really exposing how poorly and cheaply made a lot of them are. As this is all happening, he starts to directly criticize Lewis and Pleasanton like to their faces, um, which starts losing him work. And probably a little bit both because he was mad that he was losing work, but also, you know, motivated by a genuine sense of something about this really needs to change because these are very important structures and, you know, need to be done with care. Lewis, or IWP Lewis, starts appealing to Congress and saying something needs to change. So his first letter is sent in 1842 and is met with mixed results initially because both Lewis and Pleasanton are still very vigorously defending themselves, insisting that they are doing nothing wrong, they're saving the government so much money, and the lighthouses are working perfectly fine. Um, to address this, they launched two investigations led by the pro-Winslow Lewis group and the anti-Winslow Lewis group, 
And both groups come to the exact same conclusions you would expect them to. The pro-Winslow-Lewis group is saying everything is great, we don't need to change anything, and the anti-Winslow-Lewis group is saying the lighthouses are really poorly made and our lights are not bright enough. So no major changes come of this, we're kind of back where we started. But IWP Lewis was tasked with investigating New England lighthouses specifically due to rising repair costs. This report, delivered in 1843, is a really fascinating, blistering expose on the bad quality of the builds and the fitness of Winslow Lewis himself for his position. And interestingly, IWP was supported by the Blunts with equipment for the survey. So you see sort of the same group of people have really been advocating for this um, over the course of this whole decades long period. Um, this report is fascinating. I really recommend anyone with an interest in this to uh, pull it up and give it a read through on a rainy day um, someday because it's just, it's a lot of fun to read. He's a very, um, he's both, he's both very, you know, factual and professional in the way of someone from the 1840s, but very um, scathing and uh, sassy in other ways, which is, which makes it a fun read, which is unusual for a, for a report to Congress. <laughs> speaking from experience going through some other stuff. Um, but it's really also an all-encompassing breakdown of the lighthouse establishment. He isn't just criticizing Winslow Lewis's lack of experience as a contractor or construction fellow or scientist or anything like that, but it's also um, breaking down how the arrangements of the lights are poorly done, um, the actual construction, the technology used, um, giving testimony from keepers, just all sorts of stuff. Um, in the letter presenting his report, he says, while France and Great Britain have called in the aid of their most eminent scientific men to improve the construction and illumination of their coast lights, the establishment of this country has languished under the rule of ignorant and avaricious contractors, unrestrained by any law or other influences requisite to the proper government of so important a branch of public service. Um, again, his criticism of his uncle is particularly heated. Um, he uh, really gives a brutal breakdown of how poorly made his copper lamps are in all of our all of the lighthouses in New England. He says, it has been publicly asserted by the favored individual who rejoices in the title of patentee of this branch of industry that lighthouse reflectors are not optical instruments, nor in any way connected with that science. And certainly this assertion is most fully corroborated so far as the American lighthouse establishment is concerned. For among the more than 700 specimens measured during this inspection, it would be slanderous to say that any one of the number claimed relation with science and but little with art. So while doing this survey, he visited every lighthouse in New England and measured all of the reflectors. If you remember earlier, I showed the sketch of the like multi-rigged Lewis lamp thing. Not every single lighthouse just had one reflector. In fact, few, few would, few to none. Um, so he measured all these different examples and discovered that none of them were uniformly made. They were made out of different sizes, none were parabolic, the, the materials used to make them were very poor. So these are just sort of slapdash together as quickly as possible to make something passable, but not something that really worked in the way it needed to. And really just kind of highlights the lack of care that went into this. And also the ignorance of his uncle in matters of science, because this isn't something where you kind of just throw something together and it works. It's a real scientific principle that, you know, makes the light brighter. And because he didn't have that fundamental understanding, he thought, yeah, I can just throw this together and it'll work just as well. This goes even further later in the report where he directly accuses his uncle of stealing the lamp patent from England. This apparatus was a rough copy of the English method then in use. It is believed to have been copied from the apparatus at the South Stack Lighthouse of Holyhead in the Irish Channel, the patentee having visited that establishment in 1809, soon after it's being put into operation. Although a patent granted for this apparatus, the original type of which is here and traced back to the year 1784 and was the combined invention of Argon and De Borda, yet it would seem from the style of the patent that the claim was made for some peculiar magnifying and reflecting property of the lanterns. So as you see, Argon's uh, original design was something that had already been on the books for quite a while when Lewis invented his own version of it. So again, I don't really want to make the 100% assertion that he definitely stole it, but we see how uh, IWP clearly thought about his uncle's uh, inspiration for his light. Now, 
He goes into, again, how many of these lighthouses were made with improper materials, with some design choices causing the lights to basically immediately be damaged, start falling apart, and necessi- which would just create all these immediate critical repairs that needed to be done. So what Lewis would bid on these contracts and say, I can give you this lighthouse for you know not that much money, but if the lighthouse can't withstand the test of time, you're then going to have to bring in more people, pay more people to fix it, which ultimately represents a loss for the government. You want to build a lighthouse and have that lighthouse stay in good working order for you know a long time. You don't want it to be something where it breaks the second the original contract team leaves. Um, so some other great quotes we, we, I've pulled for you here. The same neglect of securing the foundations is common to all. This defect is most remarkable among the brick towers, as well as the keeper's houses, erected upon the sands of Cape Cod. The contractors have simply smoothed off the surface of the sand to a level and laid their brickwork thereon without footings, platforms, or any preparation whatsoever. He also points out that frequently, the contractors, to save material, fill the interior of the wall with rubbish of various kinds. So it's not just we're buying poor materials, we're literally using garbage to fill the walls of the lighthouses and keeper's houses. So just lots of corner cutting, lots of just not knowing how a building should be built um, and issues like that. Personally, I think one of the best things about this report is that he managed to get testimony from almost every single light keeper at all of the lights that he surveyed. Um, At this point, when we've been talking about this whole process, we've kind of got the opinions of government bureaucrats and contractors like Pleasanton and um, Winslow Lewis. We've got folks who... uh, you know, are concerned about this in one way or another, be it the Blunts who are, you know, in the maritime world or IWP Lewis, who's another government contractor, but we're kind of missing the voices of the people who actually live and work at these lights. And some of these uh, testimonies are really tragic and moving. Um, Like this one from keeper Joseph Holbrook, who was then the keeper um, at Sandy Neck, which is near Wellfleet. This light unfortunately no longer um, exists on the Cape, but, uh, you know, still a still a great, uh, very sad uh, story here. The walls of the house are set two feet below the natural surface of the beach without any other foundation. In consequence of this, the cellar was flooded with water continually. In fact, the tide ebbed and flowed regularly in the cellar. The very wretched manner in which the house was built renders it almost uninhabitable. The walls always and the roof continually leaky. Two of my children have died entirely on account of the unhealthy condition of the house. When it blows hard, the lantern on the roof rattles and shakes so as to require my constant attendance to keep the light from being shaken out. So this light at the time had been um, in use for a while, so it wasn't brand spanking new, but the testimony from Chatham is coming from a keeper who uh, expected when he got the position to have two brand new lighthouses. This photo um, is a picture of the two towers that I showed you the um, architectural drawing of earlier. They replaced the initial two wooden towers at Chatham. And um, so uh, Keeper Collins House started at Chatham Light in May of 1841, and construction on the new towers started that summer. So he really expected, like, I'm going to have this cushy new light keeper's house and two beautiful new towers. But when we see this testimony that was taken in September of 1842, that did not turn out to be the case. He says, I was appointed keeper of this establishment in May 1841. There were then here two old towers and a dwelling house, which were all in ruins being built of wood. In the course of the summer of 1841, a new establishment was erected here, consisting of a brick dwelling and two brick towers under contract of Winslow Lewis and the government. I expected to have a lighthouse and everything in first-rate order when these new buildings were put up, but I was mistaken. In the first place, the house is leaky about the roof and windows, every part being badly built as far as I can judge. The cellar and foundation walls are laid on the sand without any footing to the walls and so little below the surface that the rats burrow in from outside and infest the cellar. All the chimneys in the house smoke badly. The kitchen is built particularly bad. In the oven, which is not large enough to get anything like a good batch of bread into it, also in the walls being plastered into the brick work without furring. The house stands midway between the two towers with a covered way leading to each. This covered way leaks badly. 
The lanterns were glazed with plate glass, and during the gale of October last, both lanterns were burst in by the force of the winds, and 17 panes of glass were broken. This accident occurred entirely in consequence of the insufficient manner in which the glass was originally set by the contractor. And had I not been so fortunate as to discover the accident before the whole of the glass was blown in, both of the lanterns would have been destroyed and the lights put out. There are two lamps, one in each lantern that ranges over the land and one in each lantern that ranges through the opposite lantern. All the windows of the tower are leaky and the foundations of each tower are about 18 inches below the surface and the base walls were filled in with the stone formerly composing an oil vault. The numerous leaks about my house cause so much dampness that I find it difficult to preserve my provisions from moldering. My salary is $400. I am not allowed any boat. So this really shows that these are brand new. You shouldn't have these problems with a brand new building like this if you had someone who knew what they were doing constructing it. So the government spent all this money creating these two new towers, keeper's house, covered walkway, etc. And less than a year later, it's almost uninhabitable for this keeper and his family. So that's really, you know, a, a pretty damning review of how things are going with Winslow Lewis and his budget conscious uh, attitudes. So in general, Lewis also, or IWP Lewis, <laughs> also is a real advocate for the keepers here. He makes the point repeatedly in the report that out of everybody he surveyed, if they have a tower and a keeper's home that are well constructed and sturdy, the keepers are happy, they do their jobs well, you know, everything is great. But when the tower is falling apart and leaky and cold and rats are getting into the basement, um, the family and the and is just miserable. And that really affects the quality of their work. Keepers were also generally paid only around $350 per year, which IWP was believed was way too low for a job as important as being a light keeper. Some keepers would even take on second jobs. So while they would be acting as a ferryman or continuing to go out as like a fisherman, um, their wives and children would actually be the ones running the lights which is still common later on, but you know, not great when you've been employed to do this one job and it's not enough to feed your family. So you have to go off and kind of neglect your duties and put it off on your family 24 seven, not a good arrangement. Um, all keepers also had no written instructions on how to care for their lights. There was no employee handbook at this time, which creates a lot of problems because if you have a keeper who is very on the ball and really likes their job, you can have a really man well-managed light. But if you have someone who's a little bit more like, mm, I don't really care about this or in a situation where I need to take on a second job, there's no real way to kind of, you know, um, lay down the law essentially about if someone is neglecting their duties because they don't really have a set set of rules they're supposed to be following. And this just really highlights again how at this point the lighthouse establishment has created this very kind of unprofessional attitude of we're not hiring professionals to build the buildings and we're not hiring professionals to run them, um, which causes problems. So after <laughs> annoyingly um, another eight-ish years, Congress finally steps in in a more meaningful way than they have moving forward. In March of 1851, the Lighthouse Board is formed for the first time ever. This means that professionals um, who actually kind of know what they're talking about are now somewhat responsible for lighthouses. They get a group of Navy officers, Army engineers, experienced mariners, folks like that, to launch yet another investigation into lighthouses all over the country. Um, in On in January of 1852, they deliver their report to Congress, and as I'm sure you'll be shocked to hear, they come to the conclusion that lighthouses are poorly constructed, and the U.S. lanterns are not as bright as European lights. Many of the lights themselves are also poorly constructed, and they come to the conclusion that while Fresnel lenses do present an initial high investment because they have to be purchased and imported from Europe, um, they really represent, you know, a, you know, high investment with huge returns. Um, because the lights are so bright and relatively easy to maintain, um, it's really going to be a major game changer in preventing wrecks because, you know, if you're a business person and you're taking a ship out, the worst thing in the world to happen to that ship would be for it to wreck and have its cargo all be destroyed. It's a huge financial loss for somebody and, you know, doesn't, doesn't look good for the U.S. government too on like the loss of human life side <laughs> to have it be, you know, both a threat to industry and actual individual people. So Congress finally introduces a bill for the creation of a permanent lighthouse board, which would help really 
kind of change the tides of all of this and start institutionally a more professional attitude towards lighthouses. This bill passes on August 31st of 1852. And uh, interestingly, it was helped along after a bunch of congressmen were delayed getting to New York City from DC after offshore buoys near Sandy Hook were too weak in fog to guide their steamer into port. So uh, this is sort of one of those situations that I'm sure we're all too familiar with of as soon as it starts affecting Congress, then we start seeing some actual movement on it because they realize it's actually, you know, a big deal. So this really launches a new era for lighthouses in the US and it's one of professionalization. The lighthouse establishment is abolished and replaced with the lighthouse board. Um, the board continues to be filled with professional engineers, mariners, naval ex experts, etc. This is no longer a job where, you know, you, you're friends with the right, I mean, you're still friends with the right person, but you have to have, you know, a background in these things to be considered for it. It can't just be like, I, a museum curator, would be nominated to it necessarily. You have to be someone who really knows what they're talking about, about life on the sea and such. The U.S. is formally organized into 12 lighthouse districts, and they appoint lighthouse inspectors to each of these districts. So this person is supposed to go around and check in on all the lights, make sure that the keepers are doing their jobs properly, that the light is in good order, you know, inform folks when there are issues of like, this tower is starting to look a little skunky and needs to be replaced, or this keeper is, you know, unfortunately not doing a good job and needs to be replaced. Um, so just sort of starting to hold folks more accountable to what's going on and keeping the conversation going about when things need to be changed. Um, this is also the time when they start limiting political appointments of keepers and inspectors. This was a practice that was very common um, early on in U.S. lighthouses, where if I was a friend of the local Democrat in office, I could get um, basically picked to have this somewhat cushy government job to be the light keeper, whether or not I had any experience um, in, you know, maritime anything or not. And then even if I was very good at my job as light keeper, if my friend was voted out of office and replaced by a Whig, for example, um, our new Whig politician friend could say, all right, Emily, get out. My buddy wants to be the light keeper now. And that's not really something you want to have happen when, you know, being a light keeper is a very demanding, difficult, unusual job that isn't something that necessarily everyone off the street wants to do. Um, and it's also something that is, again, a crucial aid for navigators. So if you have someone who's very good at their job, you would think you would want to keep them there um, and have some kind of continuity for how the light is being run. So um, as the years march on, it becomes less and less common for that to be how a light keeper is um, appointed and is instead based on personal merit and whether or not you actually want the job. Um, there's actually a very interesting story about this on Martha's Vineyard, which will be featured in our exhibit opening on, on October 20th. So uh, come on down to see how that played out. Um, they also decided to formally um, install Fresnel lenses in all existing lighthouses and all future ones moving forward. Um, this is also the period where they start um, making detailed manuals and instruction booklets for both keepers and inspectors. This is the employee handbook I said was lacking before. There is now a strict set of rules you have to follow and, you know, enforceable, you know, action can be taken when you don't follow said rules. Um, the government also starts distributing uh, information about changes to lights and markers. Up until this point, it was very um, hit or miss if um, either both foreign and domestic mariners got information about if a light was going to be changed in any way or a new one was going to be built. It really was, you know, kind of the luck of the draw if you happen to hear at the time that, you know, this one used to be rotating, but now it will be stationary, which can be very dangerous because, as I've said, lighthouses can both mean this is a safe place to go around or this is a harbor to pull into or this is a really bad rock formation, stay away from me. And if you're not sure which one is which, you can wreck your ship. So this helps um, give people more of a heads up that like, hey, we're going to be doing repairs on this light. So if you're in this territory six months from now, keep that in mind um, kind of stuff. So really useful for mariners. Again, a really important change for maritime safety. They also make a commitment to investigating and adopting new technology for uh, lights, towers themselves, fog signals, light ships, buoys, et cetera, et cetera. They don't want to have a repeat of the situation where European lighthouses are so much more advanced than American lighthouses because we were so stubbornly reluctant to spend the money on doing a replacement. Um, it's going to be more of a sort of collaboration between different governments and scientists of, hey, what's the best thing so that we can all stay safe on the water versus we just want to save money. 
So uh, we get electric lights and lighthouses beginning in the 1880s, and you also start seeing more specialized designs for different light towers like screw pile lighthouses and other exposed designs instead of just the very standard brick base that uh, Winslow Lewis developed. So you might be wondering, what did Winslow Lewis think of all of this? Somewhat mercifully for him, he died in 1850, so he didn't have to watch everything he had built come tumbling down per se. Um, unfortunately for us as uh, history fans, uh, we don't have a lot of his personal correspondence preserved in archives. There are some of his ones that are more relating to the actual contracts and bids and such, but we don't have any of the petty letters that I'm sure he and Stephen Pleasanton shot back and forth complaining about people saying that they didn't know what they were doing. And really tragically, we don't have anything directly between him and IWP Lewis, which is just, I would imagine, a tragedy. I'm sure they had a lot of very awkward family Thanksgivings when they were at the height of their bickering. Um, Pleasanton was not so lucky. Basically, as soon as these changes rolled out, he got ousted from his position and never got another political appointment. He was incredibly bitter about this until the end of his life and tried to get more government offices and tried to make it clear that in his mind, he had been unfairly gained up on because he had saved the government so much money over his uh, years of public service. And really it was the fault of a few loud agitators who got him kicked out. It wasn't, wasn't anything he had done. Um, in a letter he wrote to President Fillmore asking for another position, he made his position very clear with uh, this great quote saying, the great object of this attack was to introduce the French lenses into our lighthouses, which do not suit this country. And for that reason, I opposed and still oppose the employment of them. He died in 1855, presumably still a bit bitter about how everything uh, rolled out. And unfortunately for uh, my favorite character in this saga, so did IWP Lewis. So, um, the Lighthouse Board was not the last government entity that managed lighthouses in the United States. In uh, 1910, the Lighthouse Board was abolished and replaced with the Bureau of Lighthouses and the U.S. Lighthouse Service. This is also the moment when lighthouses are transferred from the Treasury Department's responsibility to the Department of Commerce and marked a transition to be more of a civilian agency. Uh, things changed again in July of 1939, when the Lighthouse Service is merged with the U.S. Coast Guard. Um, at this point, a lot of lights around the country had been determined to be superfluous or unnecessary for one reason or another and were decommissioned. Um, but many stations that uh, are, or many stations are still active and are managed by the Coast Guard. So Highland Light in this photo is one that's been decommissioned and is just served as a um, historic building right now. But for example, Chatham is still managed as a Coast Guard station today. Um, you to sort of wrap everything up, you may be wondering, are there any still Lewis lighthouses that are still standing that I can go and visit? Um, unfortunately, on the Cape, we do not have any examples left, and they are quite rare these days, as you can imagine, because they were all, once again, poorly constructed and in need of almost immediate repair. Um, two of the best examples that are still um, available of Winslow Lewis's work are at Sapello uh, Island in Georgia. It was built in 1820 and is the oldest Lewis lighthouse that is still standing. And there's also one at Amelia Island Light in Florida, which was originally in a different location, but was moved to Amelia Island Light. Um, both of these are decommissioned and are just historic structures that you can, um, you can visit. And as for IWP light, IWP's lighthouses, um, two that he designed are still um, standing today, last I checked. Um, not sure how things are faring because they are both down in Florida and, you know, things have been a little rough down there lately, but they are both offshore lighthouses, one at Carey's Fort Reef and one at Sand Key. They're the screw pile lighthouses like the sketch I had showed you earlier. Um, so that is Winslow Lewis and the Lighthouse Establishment. Um, I think it's really it's very interesting thinking about how his, you know, long-term legacy is really the professionalization of this service, um, mostly because he was actually not great at uh, sort of his job, but also had he, you know, been a little better at being a government contractor and construction person, you know, things like this, all the professionalization might have taken longer because it took a longer time for, uh, you know, problems to be sort of noticeable. So um, it's just a very interesting story. And thank you guys for coming out on this somewhat gloomy Sunday to uh, listen to it. All right. Well, thank you so much, Emily. Um, who knew there were so much drama <laughs> in the history of lighthouses? Really fascinating. Um, 
And uh, if anyone has questions uh, at this point, feel free to type them into the chat. Um, we do have a few people in the chat who are introducing themselves from other parts of the country. So um, someone from Montclair, New Jersey, uh, who is a performing artist at a living history museum, and he performs August for now. So welcome. Um, let's see, we've got someone joining us from Milwaukee, also uh, someone who works in living history. She portrays Georgia Green Stebbins. Welcome to you, Catherine. Um, someone else asked, who is our longest serving lighthouse keeper at our North Point Lighthouse? That is an excellent question. I do not know that off the top of my head, unfortunately. Okay, we'll, we'll see if we can find out. That's, uh, that's from Catherine. Catherine, we'll see if we can um, find out and um, email you back. Um, someone from uh, Princeton Junction, New Jersey, uh, descended from Winslow Lewis. So welcome to you. Sorry to have brought up the, you know, centuries old family <laughs> drama. <laughs> Just as the wounds had started to heal. Um, and someone uh, who asks, uh, this is from Joseph Smith. Did the Fresnel lens at Twin Lights convince Pleasanton of their effectiveness, or did he simply not get it? He definitely did not get it. It was, it's interesting because while Lewis was willing to admit, you know, yeah, they are actually very bright and effective, um, Pleasanton, just as, as I, you know, showed in that excerpt from the letter from President Fillmore, he had this, you know, in, in my opinion, irrational hatred of Fresnel lenses and uh, just really saw them as sort of his, the really the focus of his ire towards everyone criticizing his job. So I feel like if it was something where he, you know, I mean, looking at them, you have to admit they're better, <laughs> they're better quality. It's just an inescapable thing. But I feel like it was something where he wouldn't have wanted to admit it publicly because it would have meant I'm wrong, essentially. Uh, someone types in who tells us the Florida reef lights are still standing. Oh, excellent. So um, that's really wonderful news from Florida. Um, someone asked uh, whether you know where IWP Lewis is buried. I believe both he and Winslow are buried somewhere in or around Boston, but I'm not 100% confident. Um, IWP Lewis is actually a really interesting historical figure because while he's very prominent in the sort of center of this argument, there isn't like a ton about him kind of personally outside of it. So he's a little bit, um, he's a little, it's, it, 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 I'm sure there is uh, something out there that sp specifies where he is physically buried, but um, I just found him sort of interesting because when you start when you start peeling back some of these historical stories, sometimes you really get like, you know, a great snapshot of someone who, you know, ultimately, you know, they're not a George Washington. Someone hasn't written like 30,000 biographies of them, but there's still a lot of information about them out there. But he's just kind of one of those figures where it's like he's really prominent at this one moment, but anything kind of before and after that are very vague and not something that people have really kind of paid much attention to. Um, he's definitely someone where if uh, you're ever going to do a genealogy or anyone finds out more information, I would love to get more info about him. Um, I was also, while starting to, you know, kind of organize this presentation, uh, this is a challenging era to, um, you know, kind of spotlight some of these folks with, because I always love being able to actually put a face to a name, but because a lot of these people are kind of, you know, low-level government bureaucrats or contractors or lighthouse keepers, and this is a period before photography, we really don't have any great, or not totally before photography, but like photography is a lot less common, um, you know, and not everybody could afford to have a portrait painted of them, or, you know, the portrait stayed with a family instead of being donated to a museum that has digitized their collections or whatever. Um, it's hard to find images of these people. And, you know, it's always sort of a shame because it's just, that makes it so much more of a human story to have, have a face, you know? All righty. Um, oh, uh, and so here's a clarification um, from Catherine again. She uh, she was saying that Georgia Stebbins, the person she portrays, is the longest serving lighthouse keeper uh, in Milwaukee at the North Point Light. Oh, excellent. So fascinating. Um, fascinating that the largest, the longest serving lighthouse keeper uh, was in fact a woman. Um, not to continue, or you know, I will continue plugging our new lighthouse exhibit, but um, we have, uh, 
So the fo a lot of the focus of the stuff that we're doing in the exhibit opening later this month is going to be on the keepers themselves because the bulk of the artifacts that we have in the collection are really related to how um, how you know these people actually ran these towers and kept them work in working order. Um, so we've got um, a fair amount of sort of discussion and um, spotlight on some of our keepers on the Cape, um, including three women. Um, we've been able to identify six or seven women who were um, like head light keepers on uh, at lights on the Cape and the islands. And uh, three of them are profiled in the exhibit alongside three male keepers. So uh, should be some cool stories for folks to uh, to get up close and personal with starting on the 20th. Wonderful. Well, um, if any of you folks who are joining us uh, from away uh, would like, if you could type into the chat uh, how you found out about today's lecture. Um, it's, it's interesting the way word travels around in the uh, digital realm. So uh, that would be great if you could. All right. If there are no further questions at this point, I think that's where we're going to leave it for today. But again, um, we really hope that you will join us for the opening of the exhibit on October 20th. Um, there's uh, all kinds of um, great stuff that's going to be in the, in the new exhibit. So I'm um, really, really looking forward to that. New acquisitions for the museum that um, folks would most likely not have ever seen before. So all righty. So um, again, we invite you to visit our website, capecodmaritimemuseum.org um, to see uh, everything that's happening this month. Um, and again, there's a lot. <laughs> so um, we hope to see you here uh, in two weeks on the 16th when um, we'll have Harmon, uh, <coughs> Harmon Dietz, excuse me, um, talking about um, reclaiming the Charles River watershed. Until that time, we wish you all the best. Take care and we'll see you soon. Bye-bye. <laughs>